Hi, so I'm a Simon Prickett. This is a talk about server sent events, which are actually part of the uh, the web standard. So it's fundamental JS. There's no um, framework trickery involved here or anything that you can't do without just a browser and some server. Uh, so the picture up there is a, a load of pipes and things arriving and disappearing constantly. And that's kind of what server sent events are about. So we'll have a look at what that means. So if you've um, worked with like data that needs to go to a front end and that data is like not, uh, it's not distinct, it's a constant stream. So something that updates over time and maybe never ever ends, then you've got a few options around how you can handle that. So you can make like a traditional HTTP request and then get a traditional HTTP response. And then the next time you want to get an update to whatever that piece of data was, say it's a stock price or the number of likes on a social media item that your web page is currently looking at or something like that, then you could go back to the server and make another HTTP request and get another HTTP response and, and keep going. Um, and this approach is kind of like called polling um, and it has a, a couple of issues. It's like, number one, it's like very resource inefficient. So you go to the server and you say, give me the latest stock price. And they're like, here's the latest stock price, it's 12.99. And then some arbitrary amount of time later, you decide to go back to the server and say, give me the latest stock price and it's still 12.99. Um, that was a wasted request response cycle that you didn't have any way of knowing was wasted because you didn't know the value had changed on the server. And if you're doing that, say, every three minutes, then the fastest you're going to see a stock update is three minutes. So one way that people used to do this was then basically narrow that interval down to, like, say, three, four, five seconds or something. And now you're making lots more requests. And even more of those requests are coming back with the same value because it's still not changed on the server. Um, so you kind of want to avoid polling approaches for this sort of data. So there's, there's a couple of other ways you can do it. Um, a lot of people might have worked with WebSockets, uh, which is basically a way of opening a connection to a server and keeping it open for quite a while and then sending requests to it and getting notifications back when something happens. So if you've used something like Firebase, you've used WebSockets. Um, if you've used, uh, oh, I forgot what it's called, but there was another framework that used it a lot as well. And you can also just build WebSockets stuff yourself. Um, and WebSockets are great and you absolutely should use them. Um, and they're a really good two-way data communication uh, solution. So if you're building a chat client or something, WebSockets excellent, avoids, uh, polling and gives you the opportunity to send and receive data from a server in a sort of event driven way. So only when it needs to be. However, um, where the server sent events fit in, uh, there are one way. So basically the client says, Hey, I'm interested in this data stream. And the server says, great, I'll send you stuff as it changes. And then the client can't send anything back after that. Um, so it's great for broadcast of things. So if you think of it like broadcast TV, um, those stock ticking, uh, values or the number of likes on a social media page or whatever it is, that's not gonna be a two way conversation. It's always going to be the server telling the client or many clients, Hey, your tweet has got like 4.3 thousand likes at the minute. Oh no, it's got 4301. Um, it's not going to be the, the client saying to the server, Hey, my tweet should now have 2000 likes. Um, so it's a one way conversation. So how does this work? Um, if we look at it in terms of how would you normally make an HTTP request? So in a browser these days, you probably normally use the fetch API and you'd fetch from some URL. And then when the server returns something from that URL, some promise would fulfill and you'd have a result that you could then do some work with. And that would kind of be the end of the cycle. So it would be, I want to get something from some backend some backend sends me the thing back, my promise fires and we're done with it. Um, the way that server sent events work is instead of using fetch or an XML HTTP request, you use this thing called an event source, which is built into the browser. Uh, it is a standard. And you basically declare an event source against some URL 
which is the server side that you're going to talk to wherever you get the data from. And the client goes away and says to the server, hey, I need this data. And the server then, instead of responding once and saying, okay, end the conversation, um, I'll see you again next time, maybe if you choose to send me another request, it keeps that uh, request open and then periodically pushes updates back to it. So I might open an event source and the server might say, oh, here's your stock price from Microsoft or whatever it is. And then when that changes a few seconds later, it might say, here's another one. And that same connection remains open, so the server can still do that. It can use this long-running connection and say, here's another one and here's another one. But once the client's open the connection, it can't then send anything further back to the server. Um, all it can do is close the connection, which will say, oh, I'm done listening to, to stock events. I don't want them anymore. So what happens across these lines here? So what messages happen? So the event source is established as a normal HTTP request. So pretty much like any other request you make. Then what comes back is uh, if you normally call a server, you'd expect to get something like a text HTML document or a CSS or a JavaScript document or an application JSON. You maybe expect to get some JSON back. In this case, what you get back is um, a format that's specific to server sent events, but is a standard. So it's basically a field name value format where each field name's on a new line. So each message has an ID, um, and that's useful because you can basically talk to the server and say, I received this ID last time. Give me everything since, since that one happened, if the server's able to do that. And it also means that they've all got unique IDs. So if you were building up like an array of these things in the client side in the browser, they're going to have some ID that you know is going to be unique. Uh, there's an event field that tells you what the event type is, and that's optional. So an event type might be stock ticker, or it might be uh, we're going to look at one that has cat facts or actually dice rolls, which is kind of convenient for the programming exercise today. Um, so a way of identifying what sort of event it is. So inside uh, a stream of events, they don't all have to be the same type. They can be anything you want. And then the data field in there can be anything you want. So you could put text or JSON or whatever you like in there. And generally, it's probably a good idea that like for every event of a certain event type, you use the same format data. So your front end knows that all stock ticker events look like the one down below. So there's a stock uh, ticker QCOM and then the price 6431. But other events might be like a JSON object. So starting with the client, how do we actually go ahead and, uh, and use this thing? So we create an event source and we point it at a URL. There's no frameworks needed in the client here. This event source is built into the browser. And then the way that event source works is rather than returning a promise or anything like uh, a normal HTTP request, which will happen the once, it's going to return a series of events. So we put in some event handlers. Um, there's a generic one called on message that fires for every event that comes back from the server. So we could use that if we knew that all the events were going to be the same type or if our logic was really simple and could deal with different events based on their type. Say it was a switch statement in there or something that says if it's a stock price, do this. Else if it's a cat fact, do that. Else if it's a some sort of user profile document, do something else. If you don't want to use a generic uh, message handler, or if you want to use something more specific as well, then you can use event source dot add event listener. You can tell it what type of event we're listening for. So in there, event type might be stock ticker or a cat fact. And then that function there will only get the uh, stock ticker or the cat fact or whatever specific type of event it's interested in. And these will keep firing as more and more things come back from the server. So once you've set this up, it's just going to keep calling these functions every time the server sends something back. So the other side of this is a server. So in order to have a stream of events coming at us, something needs to be able to uh, 
listen for a request for this and send a response back. So what we've got here is a Node.js server. Um, because the server sent event message is just a text-based standard, the server doesn't have to be JavaScript at all. It's nothing to do with JavaScript. It's just this is a convenient way of implementing one is in Node. So this could be Python, it could be C, it could be Ruby, it could be C Sharp, it could be anything you choose to implement a server in. So here what we're doing in Node is we're creating a really basic web server. And whenever we get a request, we're just responding to it with a 200. OK, we're good. We like this request. And what you'll see there is a couple of things. Um, instead of content type being text HTML, like it would be for a web page or application JSON for an API server that's returning JSON, we're telling the browser we're sending a text event stream. So we're telling it we're sending events back. And we are explicitly telling it that we want to keep the connection alive. So we're not going to terminate the connection at the end of this response. And the browser is going to keep it open. Which means that if you then look a little bit further down where I have the set interval, it means that every however often, so in this case, I have some code that just every three seconds sends a new event out. Um, and then the browser will receive that and do whatever it's going to do with it. In a real application, this would probably be, we'd hang on to that response object and like every time some business logic triggered that the stock price had been updated or every time somebody presses a button or whatever the backend server logic is, we use that response object that we've got to update the front end by writing a new event to it. So once we've got this loop kind of going on, it could technically run forever until um, somebody decides to end it. So either the client or the server can end these. Um, so the event source uh, object that the browser's got, that it's receiving events through the, uh, the handlers on, the browser can say, I'm not interested in this anymore by calling the close function. And that's going to shut down that connection between the browser and the server. And basically it will terminate the validity of that response object that the server's hanging on to. So the server won't be able to talk to the browser anymore. The browser won't be listening to the server anyway. And also the server could stop it. So in a lot of cases, these events will go on forever. So like a stock price update or whatever could just, you could be having the front end being a, a screen or something that is just displaying the company's current stock price and it'll do that for ever and a day. In other cases, you might uh, not want to do that, but you might be requesting something from the front end where the back end does a whole process. So it might be like setting up a new bank account or something, and there's different steps to that. So the server might choose to update the front end with steps like, yeah, you know, we've validated your address, we've validated your social security number, we've validated your income, um, we've done a credit score check on you and keep pinging the client back with these things. So the client can update the user as to, you know, there is something happening during this long running account setup process on the server. Then obviously only the server really knows when that account process is finished because it knows what the business logic is. Um, so the server can then basically say that I'm done sending you events in a couple of ways. It could just close the connection, which is kind of a bit dirty. Um, and then the client will just never receive any more events and it won't know why um, the server could have crashed or what have you. So the client won't know if it needs to retry. Or it can send an event that has a special ID or something special in the data that tells the, the client, hey, this is the end of the events. Um, and in that case, the client and the server both need to know what that is. So it might be an ID that's like minus one or it might be a data payload that just says end or something like that. Um, and then the client knows that nothing more is coming from the server and the front end can basically display, you know, end of process, success, your account set up or whatever versus I don't know what's happening because the server just stopped talking to me and I don't know why. Uh, okay. So these slides are a couple of years old, but I did double check this again today. Um, 
This feature is basically supported in all the big browsers. Um, it wasn't supported in Edge when I first wrote these slides. It is supported in Edge now. Um, it isn't and never will be supported in Internet Explorer, but that shouldn't be that important. Um, and all of the browsers support it from a can you use it, does it work perspective equally well. The one that has, I would say, best support for the developer is Chrome because it has this uh, debugging view that's specifically for server sent events. So you can actually see the events coming back and it parses them out into their fields and values like you can see on the slide there. And then you'll be able to actually do something useful with debugging them rather than having to put a load of console logs in your code. So we'll have a quick look at how this actually works. Um, we've got a demo here. So if I drag the browser over here and we do a debug and let me get that. Look at the network tab here on the debugger. So what's going to happen is when I click start events, we're going to create an event source and talk to a backend node server. That node server is randomly going to generate, I think, 30 events, one every couple of seconds. And they're going to fall into four categories. They're either going to be coin toss events or die roll events or cat facts or meme images. So they'll have slightly different payloads depending on the, uh, the type. So if we hit start here, give it a second. Here we go. So it threw out a cat fact and it threw out another cat fact. And now it threw out a meme image and so on. So it's going to keep generating these. And as you can see, the front ends updating. But if we look over here in the, the network browser, we're not polling. So we're not generating new requests. We're not doing a page reload. We have this one request random named events that's got a 200 and it's kind of ongoing. This is where Chrome is great. If I click this, I can see all the normal things, but I can see this event stream. So Chrome's taking the, the event messages that are coming from the server it's parsing them out so we can see message one was a cat fact and here was the data in it. Um, and then when this gets to like 30 messages, it's going to stop and it's going to send a, um, a minus one, I think it is, and the front end will then know, oh, there aren't any more and it will shut this down and it will stop happening. So it's nearly there. I'll give it a second just to actually finish that. At any point, I could random, randomly close this by hitting the stop events button, and that will clean up the connection and tell the server we're done as well. But here we go with 26, 27, 28. There's the 30th one. There we go. So we've stopped now, and the front end's gone back to a stop state. And the button's gone back to let's restart if we want to. Now, there's no for loop or anything in this front end that knew there were 30 events. The way it knows there were 30 events is this last one down here. Um, so you can make that a bit bigger. This last one down here had an ID of one, and that was uh, minus one. And that was the, uh, the ID that both the front and the back end code understand to mean there are going to be no more events. We're done. So. After 30, this finished. This code here didn't have a four, whatever, to 30 loop. It just processes events. But when it receives an event with an ID of minus one, it knows to shut things down. So that's how that worked. Um, what I was quickly going to do as well was show some code. Let's see if we can do that. It doesn't necessarily want to. That's better. There we go. So we've got some code here. Um, let's firstly look at the client. So inside the client here, we have uh, when the page loads, we basically have a look to see if window.event source exists. And if it does, then we've got a browser that supports it. Um, and we set up the UI to have a button to start processing it and all of that stuff. And if not, we just say, oh, it's not supported. We're not going to do anything with this. 
then I have got, let's see. So here we're starting our events. So when I click the start events button, you can see here I create an event source and I go to the URL of the server. So in this case, it's just a server on my machine. And I have a couple of handlers. So this one runs for every single message. So it's the on message handler. And what it's going to do is just basically log the message. And it's going to check for that special minus one ID. So if the, uh, the message was minus one, we're going to close the connection to the server and we're going to update the front end to just basically say, hey, we're done here and put the button back. So this handler here doesn't do anything with uh, updating the UI for actual messages, it just logs them and checks for the end. And for each thing that we had in the front end and each type of message, so for a coin toss uh, event, there's an event listener here that only deals with coin toss events. So what? Hello? Hey, Simon. Oh, yeah, just real quick. There's a question in the chat. Why is there a double exclamation mark for your truthiness? Uh, that's a good question. It's a trope that I can't remember why, but uh, I'll look it up. It's something to do with getting around... I also forget the reason. I thought I was hoping it's you might to do with, Yeah, I think it's something to do with getting around somebody defining something on the object that's called that that isn't what you expect it is or something. So it's really hard to see the chat from uh, presenting. Oh, yeah, that's why, I, that's why I jumped in there. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find the answer while you continue. So basically, you have one message handler here that deals with all the messages, and then these deal with specific types of message. Uh, and all they do in this case is they just find the right bit of the DOM and they update the inner HTML with whatever the data was from the message. So the message comes through as a as an object that so will have a dot data for the data field and a dot ID for the ID field. In this simple case, we could have done everything in here and just had a switch statement that says if E dot uh, type is coin toss, then do this, otherwise do that, do the other. So it's kind of the basically it with the front end. So as I was saying, there's no for loop. There's nothing in here that understands how many messages there are ever going to be. It just runs until it sees minus one. And then when it sees minus one, it closes down. So the other end of the equation on the, the server in node, we've got a pretty basic node server. It just listens on a port um, down the bottom here. We just create a web server. This is just some core stuff that we don't need to really worry about. It allows us to call the back end from any front end. Um, and then we just have one, UR one URL random named events. So that runs this function here. But let's go find you. Yeah. Not on my normal keyboard. Here we go. So whenever we get a request from a browser for server said events, we basically immediately respond and we say, yep, 200, we're going to accept that request. We're good with it. Like I said in the slides, we then set the connection to keep alive because we want to keep it going beyond this initial response. We're not going to terminate the request. And we send the content type to text event stream rather than application JSON or text HTML. Um, Possibly useful as well, we tell anything in that's between us and the browser and the browser itself not to cache this URL, because if the browser caches it and then comes back to it, you're going to get like old stock prices out of a local cache, and you don't want that. You want the latest. Uh, then all I'm doing here is just basically imitating some process that sent, takes some time. So every like three seconds, this thing's going to run. And if it's already run 30 times, it's going to send this special event that is ID minus one with no data. And we're going to end the response. Otherwise, we're basically just going to um, start building an event. So we send an ID out. So ID colon some number. And then we just randomly pick one of the message types. And then all this does is it just creates a data field with like a random coin toss or a random cat fact out of an array of cat facts. Um, and then what you notice is once we've done with response.write, we don't like response.close because in a little while, we're going to come back and write some more to this. So the server's always sending and the client's always listening. And 
then whenever the client closes the uh, the request, this function here will run. So the server also clears down because when we know the client has gone away, if the browser said, I'm not interested anymore, we don't want the server running this function every three seconds and still firing events at something that isn't listening anymore. So it's a waste of resources. So we, we clear up, we say, server, stop whatever you were doing now. We're not interested anymore. And the request and just log in the server log that we're, we're done. Um, and that's kind of it. Um, so to recap, uh, server sent events is a one-way uh, data tra transfer solution, and you're best using it for something that is like a long-running process where you want to send updates to the client, but you don't need to receive the further data back from the client. Or if you're broadcasting something that's like a display screen or something that has no user interaction anyway, it's like a, a browser that's running full screen on a TV somewhere. Uh, main advantage is it's simpler than WebSockets and it doesn't involve polling. Main disadvantage is client can't talk back. So if you need that two-way discussion, you should absolutely use WebSockets. That's kind of what I got. So I'm just looking through the uh, the chat now. Can, can I share the deck? Yeah, absolutely. I will. Um, what I'll do is while I'm still sharing, I will somewhere in here. I will share this, and this has got. Here we go. So this has got the code for this. It's also got a link to the slides and it's got a, a link to a post, which is essentially a write up of this entire talk with all the diagrams and stuff like that. So you can take this and uh, and use it yourself for anything you like, because it's MIT. Here we go. Um, well, thank you very much. So yeah, just going back up the questions. Um, oh, yeah. Is there a cost to mixing JavaScript in the front end with Python back end? Uh, no, I actually have another talk that I do where I have the same back end implemented in Node and Python. And the only real cost is like a developer cost of needing to know both of those things. But quite often, that could be two completely separate, uh, separate teams anyway. And actually, the, interestingly, the exact the application that I've got that I've implemented in both Node and Python for a meetup talk is a prize drawer application. And the back end uses, I think it's within three lines of code between the Node and the Python. So it's like almost the same like effort if you determine writing a line of code as effort. And I think that's it for questions, unless anybody has any. All right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give like another 10 seconds. But yeah, th thanks very much for, um, oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The server, the, the uh, user doesn't need to reload. And if they do, it will reset the page. So if I um, do something like, I think it's still running. Like this. So if I start the events here, and we'll start to see them appearing. So here's one and two. So there's no reloads going on here. It's just, um, it's not even strictly Ajax because we're not making further requests. So all that's happening is JavaScript's running every time an event comes in and it's adding something to here and it's updating the value in these divs in the DOM. And in this case, the value here is like an image source attribute. So if you put a string in there, so you see like conspiracy Keanu there, the image appears, there's nothing like too clever going on. But if I were to reload this, it now goes back to a state where it thinks it needs to be started. So uh, we've probably confused the server at the minute. It's probably still sending events because it doesn't know that the client died. There is also a, when you set up your event source, you can actually send the server the ID of the event that you last received. And if the server is able to resume from there with like, you know, you received like SSN check and the next step was going to be like a credit check or something in a bank account. If you had the idea of SSN check, then the server could say, oh, that was the last thing you saw, so I'll send you the next event. 
in this case, that doesn't make sense because they're just kind of random events that the server has no memory of what it sent you. Cool. I shall stop sharing then. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks.